Guild Wars, Sea of Sorrows. Chapter 2 Kobaya woke in the cold, pale morning, his head spinning with illness and fatigue. Someone was shaking his hammock. He'd been conscious of it, but too thick with sleep to rouse. As he struggled to focus, the pillow jerked out from under his head, and in a flash the whole hammock reeled and dumped him unceremoniously to the wooden boards of the deck. Five bells, Kobaya. Vost, weathered bosun of the indomitable, shouted down at Kobaya with the hammock still twisting in his hand. With a baleful glare, the leathery sailor grunted up for Krita's own sake. Winds out of the west if in our compasses boxed proper, and we've eased out of slack water and into sail. Time to heave the ropes, boy. Kobaya lifted his head and scrambled to his feet despite the pitch and roll of the ship beneath him. Aye, aye, sir, he gasped, trying to put a false energy into his words. I'm ready. The tang of seawater, stronger than he'd ever smelled it, lingered all around him, and the dark brown boards sucked sunlight from the portholes, as if jealous to see it roam free. Vost snorted. Yeah, ready, all right. Ready as a Dahlia calf fresh out in its mother. Get on your feet and try not to puke up your dinner. Green gills. And see that you do better next time. Or I'll come with a bucket of seawater to dump over ye. Win a crab in it to pinch off your nose. Today's crew inspection, sailor. Be up deck in five, or be tossed out to sea. The ship's bell rang like thunder on the main deck, its shrill clang cutting through the old sailor's snarls. With a grunt, Vost lost interest in Kobaya and stormed over to hound a man who'd been slow to find both boots. Kobaya joined several other young sailors, splashing water on their faces and scrubbing combs through their unruly hair. It was dark here in the berth, hot from the press of sailors and stinking of sweat and grime but still cleaner than many an alley in Lion's Arch where Cobia had slept on bad nights. Better food, too, and more of it, an entire apple to himself. He swiped one from the bowl and jammed it in his mouth. More eager now, he jerked his shoes onto his feet as he hopped after the others. He'd have to earn enough money to buy boots at the next harbor. These city slippers didn't have enough traction for wetboards. Kobaya smiled around a bite of apple. Only seven days aboard the Indomitable, and he was thinking about a long-term future on the ship. He'd already worked harder than he'd ever done in Lion's Arch. The intense labor wasn't quite enough to make him forget, but it was enough to occupy his mind and keep him from thinking of... Up deck, Vost yelled. Up deck, yeah, scurvy lot. Now or never and Grenth take you if you're slow. In quick succession, the mass of youths and men raced up two long ladders from the berth to the main deck of the ship. They grasped at ropes and pounded their feet on the rungs to draw them faster. Up above, Kobaya could hear the shrill call of a whistle blasting out a short rhythm of peculiar notes. Uncertain, he reached up to smooth his damp hair. All call for inspection, one of the other youths said, smiling at him. Don't worry, newbie. Captain Whiting won't even notice you. He never looks past the officers in the first row. Moving with an experienced roll to his footsteps, he scampered up the rungs toward the main deck. Kobaya managed a shy smile of thanks. Was it that obvious? Although he'd never been to sea, he knew the ins and outs of ships from his time-loading crates and wares. He'd cleaned them, too, stem to stern, while they rested in the harbor. Lion's Arch was a seaport, after all, and most of the pickup labor was on the docks. He'd never been to sea, but he wasn't exactly a rube. Just then the ship tossed under him, and Kobaya felt his stomach churn. The other boy grinned and clapped his shoulder. Kobaya sighed. Fair enough. His head crested the upper deck, and just as he'd done every day on board, Kobaya found himself staring out at the sea. All around the galleon, the sea spread vast and deep blue. Touches of white flecked it here and there. But to the naked eye, no sign of land or harbor broke the smooth, even plain of the ocean. 
the sound of waves crashing against the wooden hull, and the sharp crackling of wind in the broad sails of the galleon filled the air. Warm sunlight shone down upon the brown and gray deck, reflecting from polished iron small guns at either side. Huge white sails arched above him, their massive bulk speeding the ship across the water. It was a little bit creepy to a city boy who was used to the breakdown of streets and buildings, a horizon dotted with trees, meadows, and mountains high above. Here was the ship. Out there was nothing at all. What's wrong, you? One of the sailors shoved him from below. Keep going. We've all got to get up deck. Sorry, Kobaya said, abashed. Quickly, he stepped up his pace again and climbed out of the berth and onto the deck. He pushed forward with the others, seeking the end of the nearest row so that he could join the line. The youth beside him grinned unevenly, his smile a dashed line broken by two missing teeth. He was only a little older than Kobaya, with dark brown hair pulled into a short ponytail at the back of his neck. Don't worry about it, he whispered conspiratorially. It seems like a lot of nothing would be boring after a while, but it takes a bit of getting used to, watcher. Yeah. Kobaya smiled in return. The morning wind was steady and rippled the sail above him. He felt its cold fingers tug on the blond shag of his hair. Suddenly chilly, Kobaya pulled his sleeves down and wrapped his arms around his ribcage, trying not to shiver while the last of the sailors joined the lines on deck. Soon, the crew stood six rows deep in rough formation beneath the mainsail. They kept their backs to the forecastle and faced the quarterdeck, looking toward the stage-like balcony at the rear of the ship. Her point's in the wind, sir, came the call from the crow's nest. The bosun's whistle blew again, and the sailors stiffened. Not understanding, but willing to follow their example, Kobaya did the same. On the high quarterdeck, three figures emerged from the shining oak doors of an interior cabin, stepping out onto the polished decks. Their yellow coats, set off at neck and knee, with green striping, glittered brightly in the sunlight. Vost stepped forward and blew the boatswain's whistle in a sharp military pattern, snapping his arm down after the last blast of his signal. Kobaya stared. He'd never seen the rough and tumble boson act with such formality, and he found it a little disconcerting. On the balcony, an older man stepped forward, hemming and clearing his throat uncomfortably. In a long-winded, cheerily pompous sort of way, he introduced himself as Damron, the ship's pilot. With his black hair slicked over his forehead in a swoop from one side to the other, Kobaya thought he looked very much like a crow. Damron peered past a thick pair of spectacles to check names in a large book, which he read out one by one to be sure everyone was aboard and accounted for. Every time a sailor answered to his name, Damran would squint at him and scribble notes on the manuscript pages. The second of the three officers on the balcony was a woman, stern-looking and hawkish, her brown mane tied back with a ribbon to keep the wind from mussing her near immaculate curls. On her lapel, she proudly wore the Critton Service Medal that marked her as an official member of the King's military. She spoke for only a moment demanding good behavior and condemning scoundrelous activity to punishment and the brig. As she spoke, her eyes raked each man below like a tiger sharpening its claws. When she stepped back, Kobaya breathed a sigh of relief. Who was that? He whispered to the youth beside him. Is she the captain? Nah. That's first mate Chernock, the other sailor muttered, shushing him. Don't let her catch you talking in line. She means what she said about the brig. At last, the third man on the balcony stepped forward to address the sailors. He was square-jawed and burly, though he stood at least a head shorter than his lanky first mate. His pale coat had cream-colored ruffles at the wrists and neck, and over that he wore a wide baldric of emerald green. The baldric shone with trinkets and military honors, Markers of this sea crossing, and that port, and the man's heavy black boots were shined to a mirror polish beneath his clattering spurs. The man walked with a stiff, self-conscious gait, 
furrowing his brow quite purposefully to show an attitude of intense concentration. Sweat touched the powdered forehead beneath his three-pointed green hat. He looked so pompous and so silly that it took effort for Kobaya not to laugh. Captain on deck. Full attention for Captain Whiting, Vost called out. Kobaya stiffened a bit and looked around at the other sailors. This was as close as such a rabble ever came to full attention. Interesting. But where was the... Wait. Kobaya suddenly realized what Vost meant. That prancing ninny's the captain? With a nervous gait, the squat little man approached the balcony rail, staring very fixedly over everyone's head toward the front of the ship. The captain glanced about idly, looking at the masts and the rigging, then the ocean all around them, until at last he turned to the side and murmured something indistinct to the first mate. Kobaya strained to hear the words, hoping that the captain would say something inspiring, like the great sea captains he'd always heard about in sailors' tales. Instead, Captain Whiting spoke quietly to his first mate, and then to his pilot, and seemed completely uninterested in everything else. After a moment, he stepped back from the railing, wiping his hand on his sleeve with a forgetful sort of sigh. Without even a word for the assembled sailors, the captain turned his back to the crew and strode through the rear door of the forecastle, heading back into his quarters. Dismissed, cried Vost, lifting his whistle to his mouth again to blow the call to disperse. The two other officers congratulated themselves on a successful muster and followed the captain through the brass-studded door. Kobaya could feel the tension lift from the crowd, and sailors began to talk in two loud voices, praising themselves or calling out for work to be done. Most of them didn't even look up toward the balcony again after Voss's whistle. Kobaya stared hard at the ornate it closed, wondering what was beyond it. That's all? Kobaya couldn't help but blurt out. He colored slightly as others looked over in annoyance. It all seemed silly, the captain's preening strut on the quarterdeck, the sailors all in a row. What had been the purpose of it all? That's it. First day assessment, said the youth in line beside him, nodding. His ponytail bounced with the movement. They just need to count heads so they know how much money we're to have when we make landfall in Caning City. That, and warn us against scoundrelous behavior. Just like they do every time. Despite the world weariness of his tone, the other fellow didn't seem much older than Kobaya's sixteen years. Eyeing him warily, Kobaya asked, You've been through this a lot? Three times. The other boy puffed out his chest and tried to look jaded. I'm an experienced deckhand. Don't worry, you will be too once you get your sea legs. It's a good life here on ship, and despite what it looks like, the captain pays fair, and the bosun spares the whip. Even when we screw things up a bit, you'll see. But, Captain Whiting, Kobaya glanced up at the balcony once more. Doesn't he do anything? Like what? The young sailor laughed. Cook our meals? Swab the decks? Sing shanties while we repair the sails? Grenth's imps. No. And we don't rightly want him to. An officer trying to do honest work on a ship's like a monkey trying to paint the king's picture. Poop everywhere and a right mess to clean up after. He laughed, and despite himself, Kobaya joined in. Clapping Kobaya on the shoulder, the youth continued. Captain Whiting doesn't care about us. He just cares about paying us. With luck, we won't see him nor his officers again till the next dock's in sight. See, that's why sailors call him the gull. When you catch a glimpse of the captain's fluttery white wings, the boy flapped his hands in the air to mimic the captain's ruffled sleeve cuffs. It's a sure tell we're close to landfall. An older man interrupted their jocularity. On with you, Sethus. The sailor shoved both youths firmly, pushing them toward the fore of the indomitable's three masts. There's work to be done. You there. Yeah, green stripling, go with Sethus. Help him with the ropes. Sethus, huh? Kobaya stuck out his hand. My name's Kobaya. Posh-sounding name for a scrub. 
You got any others? Bit more fit for a sailing man? The dark-haired lad said, looking skeptical. Nodding, Kobaya answered, Kobe. Right then, Kobe it is. Let's get to work before Vost hangs us by our heels on the yardarm. The Indomitable was a hundred and a half feet long, thirty-eight feet across the beam, and more than eighteen feet from the main deck to the bottom keel. She had two lower decks resting beneath the main planking, one for the sailor's berth and one below for ballast, cargo, and stores. Three masts full of huge, square-rigged sails fluttered boldly against the wind. She was armed with thirty cannons below and twenty-six smaller carronades above to each side, for a total of one hundred and twelve guns, a solid ship of the line built in the proud shipyards of Lion's Arch. As he worked, Kobaya explored, studying every hatch and timber and learning every line of the rigging from the massive topsails to the broad triangular jibs that stretched out over the decks. For the rest of a very long day, Kobaya followed Sethis through the ship. He caught a moment of rest whenever the work slowed, which wasn't often. Sethis taught him to wrap rough shark-skin straps around his palms and climb the rigging of the ship like a monkey, throwing down cast-off ropes as they were replaced with new ones. Below, less agile sailors picked up the ropes and twisted them along the length of their forearms to bundle them away. It was a struggle to keep up with Sethis, but Kobaya managed. Before he knew it, Vost was blowing the bosun's whistle for change of shift. Arms aching, legs sore from keeping his balance, Kobaya headed gratefully down to the crew's berth. Sethis went with him, chattering about the things they could look forward to when they docked in Caning City. We're carrying cotton bales to the Canthans, Sethus said as he hopped ahead. Like a cargo of gold, that is. There's a bit of extra pay in it for us if the ship makes port early. We always pray that Grenth keeps the pirates off our route and the wind on our course. He slowed, and Kobaya pushed past to see what had gotten his light-footed friend's attention. Another sailor, a bit older than them, but far more weathered, stood at Kobaya's cubby in the crew hold. In an instant, Kobaya could tell the man had been going through his things. What's this, then? sneered the older boy, pulling the worn rag doll from under Kobaya's blankets. As he spoke, the sailor shook the rag doll lightly. You brought your dolly to see? A rough burst of laughter erupted from the assembled sailors, and Kobaya felt his face grow flushed. Angry, Kobaya reached across the netting and grabbed the doll's legs. Give me that. It's none of your concern. They tugged it back and forth for a moment before the sailor let go. With a flip of his hand, the other boy laughed. Sethus chuckled good-naturedly. Leave Kobaya be, Tosh. This is his first passage. It'll be his last if he's that much a sissy. Tosh had long, greasy hair pulled into a thin ponytail that snaked between muscular shoulders. His face was pockmarked and unpleasant. Although his clothing was worn, it had no patches, not even on the elbows of his belligerently crossed arms. As the other sailors laughed again, Tosh's brown eyes, narrow as a terrier's, mocked Kobaya's obvious embarrassment. Come on, Kobaya. Sethus tugged at his sleeve. Tosh a big bully. Dinner'll be waiting in the mess hall. Sethus tried to pull Kobaya away, but he ignored it and kept his eyes on Tosh's jeering grin. Dolly, Tosh considered, rubbing his chin, maybe that's what we'll call you. Eh, new fish? Are you a little Dolly, too? Shut your mouth, Kobaya growled between gritted teeth. Quickly, he shoved the doll into his pillowcase. He rolled that into the hammock and tucked everything back into his small cubby. There were a few other things in there, mostly because of Boson Vost's charity. Another shirt, a spare pair of woolen socks, a fork, a bowl, and a thick wooden mug. If Vost finds out you've gone through my things, you'll get a day without rations. Yeah, you just try and tell him that through a pair of swollen lips, Dolly. Tosh pushed, shoving Kobaya back. Thick, Ropey muscles stood out on his arms from years of labor aboard the ship, 
he grinned again, defying Kobaya to talk back. By now, several of the other sailors had begun paying attention. Dolly, sing song to the ponytailed youth, laughing. You cry at night, Dolly? Maybe mate Chernock'll be your mommy. Want me to ask her? Kobaya had been in fights in Lion's Arch. When a new kid came to work on the docks, the others picked on him ruthlessly, like the packs of wild dogs around Lion's Arch testing, to see if a new stray was strong enough to join their pack. The streets of Lion's Arch were tough on a kid alone. More so when your mother was a penniless drunk. He wasn't the best fighter or the strongest. But he knew how this worked. The idea of a beating didn't bother Kobaya. He'd had worse at his mother's hands than they could ever give. But if these men thought he was weak, well, then the humiliation would never stop. There was nowhere to go, nowhere he could run or hide from the bullies, and portage to Kantha would take nearly eight weeks. What was he going to do, avoid Tosh? For months? On board a ship? Staring at Tosh's smarmy face, Kobaya let his anger go for the first time. He was sick of losing, sick of being picked on, sick of fighting for the things he loved, only to see them taken away. He missed home. He missed Viviane, and that doll was all he had left of her. They weren't going to take it from him, and he wasn't going to hide it because he feared them. He wasn't going to be the stray. All the anger that he'd held back when his mother was taking things out on him, all the frustration of Viviane's death, suddenly rushed through Kobaya's veins, channeling itself into pure, cold rage. Dolly, Dolly, Tosh sang, still trying to grab Kobaya's bundled blankets. Kobaya snarled sudden resoluteness. My name is Kobaya, you stupid, prancing sot. Kobe, if you're my friend, but you're not. So shut your stupid mouth and keep your filthy hands off my things. Then, as if announcing that he'd nothing at all to fear from Tosh. Kobaya reached out and shoved the pockmarked sailor as hard as he could, nearly knocking the surprised sailor over. If you touch my stuff again, Kobaya threatened, I'll toss you into the sea. With that, Kobaya turned his back on Tosh and stuffed the bundle into the cubby, marked with his initials. There was an echoed murmur from the other sailors when he turned away. They knew that Tosh couldn't allow that kind of brush off and still keep his reputation. Sailors clustered closer, like vultures hoping to feed. Oh, you got to ruffle him good now, Tosh. Don't let the green gel talk to you like that, called an eager voice in the crowd. You best show Dolly's place. Snarling in embarrassment, Tosh spun Kobaya around and shoved back, forcing him to stagger into one of the hammock poles. A sharp burst of white sparks filled Kabaya's vision as his head cracked against the wood. He grabbed the pole and shook his head to clear it. All around, the rest of the sailors were gathering, cheering excitedly for a fight. Sethus tried to call them to reason, but nobody was listening. Like the dog packs in Lion's Arch, they were hoping for a fight. Come on, Dolly, Tosh growled, eyes narrowing. You're nothing but rag and stuffing. That doll belonged to my sister, Kobaya snarled. She died back in Lion's Arch. Touch it again, and you'll be the one who gets ripped apart. I swear it on Grent's knuckle bones. Before Tosh could react, Kobaya hurled himself forward, burying his shoulder in the soft part of Tosh's midsection. Shocked, the other youth choked. As the older boy bent in half from the blow, Kobaya straightened, bringing his fist up to crack Tosh in the jaw. Eager cheers and laughter rose from the other sailors. Kobaya, Sethus pleaded as he backed away from the crowd. I'll go get Vost. Just hang in there. He turned to run, and Kobaya lost sight of him. Vost. Bah! I'll wipe the deck with you before Vost gets here, and no one'll tell the tale. Tosh wiped a bit of blood from his lip and squared off against Kobaya, this time ready for the pale boy to make a move. You going to run away like your little friend, Dolly? But Kobaya had started this fight, and he was determined to end it. 
Tosh cut loose with a jab as quick as a striking hawk. It caught Kobaya's cheek, snapping his head to the side. Kobaya stumbled but recovered in a flash, double-punching Tosh's gut again, taking advantage of his previous success. Tosh grunted in pain but didn't fall. With a spin, Tosh responded with a heavy kick to Kobaya's knee. Even as he fell, Kobaya reached out and grabbed Tosh's ponytail, jerking the other boy to the floor as well. Together, they rolled about on the floor, legs kicking and flailing as the crowd shouted encouragement. Gaining the upper hand, Kobaya rolled onto Tosh and gouged his eyes with both thumbs. Still, Tosh was stronger, and before Kobaya could get a good push, Tosh rolled him over and started punching Kobaya in the face. Two blows, and blood spilled down Kobaya's cheek. A third, and he felt his eyes start to swell. Give up, Dolly, Tosh taunted. You can't win. All around them, sailors were encouraging them to fight harder and passing silver back and forth with eager wagers. As he mopped at his eye with the back of his hand, Tosh leaned forward to laugh in Kobaya's face. He could taste the coppery tang of blood in his mouth, feel the skin beginning to puff up and blur his vision. Ignoring the pain, Kobaya seized his chance and leaned forward to sink his teeth into the bully's ear. Tosh screeched and tried to pull away, but he couldn't get his ear out of Kobaya's grip. Raising his arms to either side, Tosh sent blow after blow into Kobaya's ribcage. Kobaya didn't care about the beating he was taking. He simply refused to give in. Tosh howled, screaming and kicking, but Kobaya was relentless. Kobaya released his bite and hit him with a double strike of his fists. One of the other sailors tried to pull him back, lifting Kobaya bodily away from his foe. Kobaya pulled free and leapt back into the fray, going for the wounded ear again. Help! Tosh screamed. He's gone mad dog crazy! Get him off me! Tosh rolled back and forth, trying desperately to throw Kobaya. At last, Kobaya let go of his opponent's ear and punched Tosh dead in the face. Blood spurted from Tosh's nose as Kobaya followed up by driving a knee into his groin. Suddenly, hands grasped Kobaya's shoulders and jerked him away. Three brawny sailors held on to him, their faces pale, eyes swollen shut, lip split and spitting blood out of his mouth. Kobaya twisted and nearly broke free again. Let me go! He snarled. I'm not done. To the mists with you! Tosh skittered backward across the floor in terror. Blood dripped from his broken nose as he gasped. Keep that madman away from me! Back away, you lot! Bosun Vost shoved through the knot of sailors. He scowled in rage and put his hands on his hips. What's going on here? Glaring, he took in Tosh's hunched posture and torn cheeks, as well as the rapidly growing bruise swelling on Kobaya's jaw. You know the rules. No fighting aboard ship? Am I going to have to flog the both of you? Sethus, standing at Vost's side, was the first to speak up. I told you, Bosun. Tosh tripped, and, um, Kobaya tried to catch him. Then they both got tangled. The crowd began to scatter and duck back to their own bunks, each sailor afraid of the bosun's wrath. Tripped? Vost's eyes darkened. Kobaya, is this true? Yes, sir. Kobaya gulped, glancing from Sethus back to the injured Tosh. Vost's withering glare turned colder. It felt like the pause lasted for hours, but eventually Tosh managed to say, It's true. The boson looked back and forth between them with a grim nod. You tripped and broke your nose. Vost crossed his arms and fumed. Fine. You two trippers get swabbing duty tonight instead of dinner. But, sir, Sethus began, and Vost rounded on him. You two for bringing me down here over nothing. Sethus quailed and fell silent. The boson looked between the three youths and scowled. I'll let it slide this time. You're tripping, but the next time I catch any of you at it, or fibbing about it, you'll be tripping at the end of my whip. Am I clear, you dogs? 
Yes, sir. All three chorused at once. Vost grumbled and spun on one heel, pointing at Kobaya. You and Sethis go up on deck. I want you to polish the brass up there until I can see Ilona in it. As for you, Tosh, the bosun leveled a stern glare at the other boy. You head below decks to the bilge pumps. You'll check every pump for air holes, even if you have to drown yourself doing it. With the whole ship between you, you should have plenty of space to cool down. Do I make myself clear, gentlemen? Vost shouted bracingly. It wasn't a question. Stiffening his back, Kobaya bellowed, Yes, sir! With the rest. Now get going, Vost growled. Kobaya and Sethis raced upstairs as Tosh slunk toward the ladder that led to the lower hold. Nearly tripping over their feet, the two youths clambered out of the berth and hurried through the press of sailors at work on the deck. Grateful to feel warm wind on his face, even if his stomach was growling, Kobaya retrieved the brass polish from a small storage hold. Sethis grabbed a small pile of rags. With an overdramatic sigh, he said, Let's start with the figurehead. The rest of the brass is on the forecastle, and I'd rather stay out of the bosun's way for a while. The figurehead of the indomitable hung at the fore of the ship, just beneath the bowsprit. Masterfully formed and easily recognizable, the brass woman's glorious figure curved against the keel of the ship, as if her back were arched in flight. Six arms rose from her curving torso, two reaching up to the sky, two more spread back against the ship in mute protection, and a third and lowest pair curled down like the graceful limbs of a belly dancer, enticing her audience. She was beautiful but hellaciously difficult to keep from turning green. Once they were polishing her, Sethis whispered, Where did you learn to fight like that? Kobaya ran a hand through his hair, feeling the bruises where Tosh had knocked him around. When you grow up on the streets of Lion's Arch, you learn to fight. So, you're a thief? Scowling, Kobaya retorted, I don't steal things. I just learned how to take care. Sethis nodded, taking that in. After a moment, he blurted out, You didn't have to fight Tosh. You could have walked away from the fight. We'd have gotten your old doll back sooner or later. What? Have Voss step in on my account? Kobaya snorted. That would have only made it worse. In a week? Three weeks? Everyone would be helping Tosh pick on me. I'd be scum. He smeared polish roughly on one of the rags. Terrible idea. I guess. Sethus paused. Is that why you went crazy down there? You looked feral. Sethus shook his head in amazement. You looked like a char. You know, big teeth, claws, four ears, fuzzy killing machine. I know what a char is, Sethus. Seriously. I thought you were going to start foaming at the mouth. You were a wild thing. He made snarling noises and sank his fingers like claws into the brass polish. Kobaya chuckled. I wasn't acting like a char. I've just seen plenty of bullies in my time. I know what happens if they think they're in charge. Despite his sore jaw, it was nice to laugh again. He wiped the brass forehead with the rag, rubbing the polish in circles. If you ignore a bully, he just gets worse. Soon, everyone else joins in, and before long, you're in a hole you can't get out of. I could beat Tosh, but I knew I couldn't beat Tosh and his friends if they all attacked me together. A bully is one thing. A crowd. His smile faded. Anyway, I wasn't trying to win. I was trying to scare him. I wanted to show him, and everyone else, that picking a fight with me wasn't worth the cost of winning. Sethus settled down on the other side of the figurehead and wrapped his rag around one of the woman's elegant arms. Isn't that a little extreme? Exactly, Kobaya nodded grimly. It's all in the attitude. See, if you think a bully can beat you, then he'll know he can beat you. You have to make them think you're a difficult target, too dangerous to provoke. Frowning, he scrubbed at the brass. If you want to stop a battle from turning into a war, you have to scare the other guy as fast and as hard as you can. Who taught you that? 
Kobaya paused. My father. He was a soldier in Krita before he came to Lion's Arch. He retired from duty after the war and became a sailor. Perhaps hearing some sadness in Kobaya's tone, Sethus asked, What happened to him? Shrugging, Kobaya answered, He went out to sea and didn't come back. For a moment Sethus thought about that, rubbing the polish from the metal with the dry side of his rag. When it was bright and shining, he asked, Kobaya? What would you have done if Tosh won? Then at least it'd be over. Either way, he wouldn't pick on me any more. He studied the brass and worked to make it shine as brightly as it could, letting the conversation fall into silence. You're crazy, Kobe, Setha sighed at last, buffing the maiden's elegant shoulder. Maybe so, Kobaya grinned. But now the bullies know it, too.